Good evening, everyone, I think. Um, this qualifies as proper evening, 10, 10 to 6. Um, and welcome to this talk, um, after which I hope you, every one of you will be down in tears, uh, crying about um, how, well, how the general situation with regards of SSL, uh, TLS deployment in general is. Um, so now, who of you, before we start off, who of you is, considers himself a system administrator? Hands up. Okay. So who does, um, who does development on mobile platforms? Uh, on non-mobile platforms? Okay, perfect. Who of you has consciously programmed you, um, uh, and used HD, uh, uh, used SSL in any way? Okay. So let's see um, if I can blow your mind or if you go like, yeah, I, I knew before. Um, so um, who am I and why am I here? Um, so the history is that I am one of the guys who uh, develops uh, the uh, desktop client for OwnCloud. And obviously, OwnCloud is a very security sensitive software. Um, and you do want the uh, data properly um, secured while they're transferred to the server. Um, funny thing is, we realized that essentially uh, we did have a great SSL stack. But we were to invent things over and over and over again, which are already part of the browser. So I thought maybe someone else has solved this, and how do others go about this? And the sad fact was that actually nobody else really, well, they were either doing a minimal solution or they, in fact, just didn't do anything. Uh, what that means, we'll see in a minute, and it's not a good thing. Um, and so, um, in my other life, I used to be uh, 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 contributing to Qt, uh, not uh, like for my daily, uh, as part of my daily work. Uh, nowadays, it's more of a hobby or uh, part of, well, it pays off because we're actually using Qt. Um, and so I decided to go a bit into the SSL rabbit hole, uh, contributing to the Qt stack. And uh, this is very important. I am not a security expert by any means. This is just a collection of studies that other people have conducted and anecdotes that I would like to share to make your life less of a hassle than I had to go through. Well, um, why do we need to talk? Quite obviously, um, many things around SSL aren't really good. Um, and you should see what we can do to change this. And what is actually the problem? And what are people avoiding to do? Because it's so crappy, because people are lazy. And well, what can we do about it, actually? Um, because obviously, this is not Post Snowden, and I have to say this, post Snowden, this is not something that we can keep, uh, keep continue doing, right? Um, so why specifically do we need to talk? We need to talk because whenever somebody sets up a server, it looks exactly like this. It looks exactly like this. Why does it look like this? Well, there are two reasons. Nobody gets a certificate. Everyone rolls out his own. Uh, if they roll their own, they never, uh, ever build a proper CA, at least for themselves. Um, they usually just go self-signed. And what happens then is what you see here. Some browsers actually correctly indicate that this is HTTPS, but there are some issues with this. You see it uh, in Chrome. You see it in Internet Explorer. However, on other browsers, once you've nodded away their scary booby doo uh, security warnings, they show this indistinguishable from normal SSL connections, at least to the novice person. Um, and this 
is anywhere between wrong and dangerous. So, um, we'll, so I hope, given that there are probably more search admins in here, I hope there's going to be uh, content for every one of you. Um, I'm trying to cover both. I'm more of a, uh, of a developer, but of course I'm also doing systems administrations. Um, this is not going to be uh, a basic uh, computer security lectures. I leave that to others that can do that much, much better. Same for advanced lectures. I'm, I, I will cover things that need explanation. If I don't and you can't follow along, please make sure to interrupt me. Um, for more complex questions, we have 15 minutes of Q&A. At least that's what I hope. Um, okay, um, this is just the gentle warning. If you had any illusions about SSL uh, and you're not like following uh, closely, then this may possibly destroy some illusions you may still have. Okay, so um, our main topic today is SSL or TLS. And I keep saying SSL just because I think Everyone refers to SSL, even software refers to SSL. I know it's TLS, but please, for heaven's sake, let me say SSL. It's going to be a lot less confusing. Thank you. Um, so what is SSL? SSL, uh, Secure Socket Layer, is uh, a proprietary protocol that has been introduced by Netscape uh, back in 1994. And the idea was to encrypt connection and to authenticate domain, so you know actually who you're talking to. Uh, it's using X509, um, trusted ITU standard, um, uses ASN1, which uh, a good friend of mine uh, in his talk about the very same issue called unfortunately complicated. Now to appreciate that statement, you have to know that he's British and British like understatements. Right? Um, so, well, SSL2, unsurprisingly, turned out to be not very secure. Um, so enter SSL3 only one year later. Still proprietary, but much better designed. Uh, and again, I'm not going into the details. There are a lot of papers detailing on that, and I'm not going to bore you uh, about the details. Um, finally, years later, and this is partially because the underlying X501 sta uh, X509 standard wasn't ready and they were waiting for it. Uh, we had TLS1, um, finally an ITF standard, um, and this was 1999, so having the, uh, a triple DES mandatory was a good thing. We had a wide, a wider range of uh, cipher suits. Um, And actually, it's pretty simple. Uh, you have a certificate, you have a subject, you have an issuer, you have a public key, you have a couple of extensions. What could possibly go wrong? There is a certificate. Um, and basically, I'm going to show this uh, on the next slide um, because I couldn't fit the screenshot here. It's very simple. You have a trusted root anchor, a uh, certificate authority. Uh, that's conveniently shipped with your browser, and you, uh, through one or more intermediates, you can easily verify um, the actual certificate. So it's great, right? Well, maybe not. Um, this is, uh, who knows what that is? Come again? Um, it's possibly also that. I took that from uh, the recommended cipher list uh, of the, the uh, Mozilla project, which they recommend everyone to, um, to configure. Um, and this is because uh, I had a blog post where people were basically asking, okay, why should we be using this? And others were saying, I just want this to work. And whenever I have people saying I want this to work, which is completely legit, you, I mean, cipher suits are, uh, are a very special topic that you actually have to understand. Um, and you have to know why Goa's counter mode is the new hot shit and how it's totally not related to cigarettes. Um, so that's, that's fine. You just have to understand 
what's a good, uh, what's a good uh, cho uh, choice of uh, cipher suits at the time? And you have to know how to verify that it is a good choice. Um, so, just for a minute, um, this has come up all again. So, um, any CA can sign any domain. Um, and you can make up all, you, all the conspiracy theories you want. Half of them may be true, half of them not. Uh, but there are way too many uh, certificate organizations uh, that can actually issue certificates. Um, and again, if you trust Walt Disney, this is completely fine. Um, I find the amount of CAs that can issue, again, certificates for any domain, um, a bit scary. Um, hmm? Honest Ahmed. Honest Ahmed, yes. He will also gladly sell you certificates. Um, next issue, oops. Um, we blow up a CA. Did you know to her, anyone? Um, this is the unfortunate situation where there is no, um, no real solution to the problem. You can roll out uh, um, CRLs, so revocation lists. A, like with about everything I've seen up to date, it's, uh, it's, it's a blacklist. It's not a whitelist. So you can be lucky. Maybe you're not, probably you're not. And the biggest problem with the CRLs, they're not checked. So what good is it anyway? Um, and again, there are a lot of very, very good proposals out there. And I'm going to outline the one that I think has the best potential. Um, but nothing works today. You can explicitly enable it. You will probably see a drop in fidelity. Um, but yeah, that's what it is. Next big problem, SSL virtual hosts are not understood by most sysadmins because what they're used to is they configure their virtual hosts in Apache, Nginx, you name it, and you're done. Unfortunately, with SSL, it's slightly more complicated. And by slightly, I mean a fucking lot more complicated. Um, which is, again, because you have to have uh, your certificates right. You have to have your specific SSL configuration, which even depends between versions of a particular software, right? Um, it's simply not as easy unless you know what to do. The problem is you have to, because otherwise you will see exactly what we saw in the beginning. You will see certificate warnings. Uh, some warnings actually go without you ever seeing it in the browser. This is something very interesting. We have bug reports in the OnClock client only on macOS, uh, where people were saying, I have a completely correctly installed uh, installation uh, uh, setup. And uh, every browser is fine with it. Only OnClock complains that it's not, that it's for some reason not correct. Uh, interestingly enough, um, it wasn't correct. Of course, um, well, we weren't correct, uh, completely correct either because uh, it was just supposed to, to be a warning and, and we just kicked the bucket on it. Um, but a lot of warnings that um, web uh, servers issue about SSL are um, error-type warning, it's called in the specification. Error-type warning. Error-type warning SSL errors are not usually displayed in browsers. And again, a lot of this has to do with browsers anticipating their web servers are not correctly configured, hence they do not show an error or a warning. So as a sysadmin, you don't get to see the, what the problem is. Um, well, next uh, is something I mentioned at the beginning, self-signed certificates. Um, if you like this for testing, in your own closed environment, it's fine. The problem is there is this much of a margin between I'm testing this for myself and I'm giving access to everyone else in the world. And then this thing completely falls apart. Um, so self-signing is not a good solution. 
You can roll your own uh, CA for this purpose, and, I'm, and again, I'm explaining later why I, I think this is a problem. Um, poor server configuration is another thing we see. Um, SSL v2 is still enabled in, today, in some of today's uh, SSL setups, and this should really scare you, uh, because SSL v2 is, well, let's, let's just not make this an option. Um, we see weak ciphers, we see installations that have null ciphers enabled. Null ciphers are great for one thing, debugging. For the rest, you could just, just forget about it. Um, you don't want it. Um, bad practices, this is more of something that's on top of the web server. If you have mixed content, I mean the web today is mixing websites. Let's not kid ourselves, right? You integrate other services, you load your, uh, your font awesome package from remote service because what the hell? Um, essentially, um, this creates problems if your HTTPS and your rem remote website isn't because your browser rightfully says, I'm not going to load this. Um, because there could be a man in the middle and, this, and then my whole uh, security concept blows. Uh, finally, intermediate certificates, and this is what we see up there in the corner. Um, even Google, and this is why I have this, Google has their own certificate authority, Google Interme uh, Internet uh, Authority G2, which they themselves and other browsers, of course, also have in their root certificate. But um, they themselves have, uh, have a signature from the GeoTrust CA, which is well established, but even that one is signed by Equifax. Um, and again, this is for compatibility reasons. You want to make sure that even, if, uh, even though your certificate is probably included in most browsers, um, you want this to work. Um, so if you don't include your intermediates, and you're probably not Google, you're, gonna, uh, you're going to need the intermediates all the time, um, most browsers smartly will say, oh, wait, there is intermediate missing. Let me look that up and download that for you. Um, that decreases fidelity. It takes about one or two seconds for, for at least initially. And then, then uh, browsers will usually cache it. But if you're not dealing with a browser, um, there's a good chance that your program will not work. And this is, again, something that we saw uh, during the development of the OnCloud client. Uh, where the OnCloud client uh, showed a warning because it could not establish the trust relation, uh, while the browser, of course, was simply looking it up. Okay, so I was mentioning this X509 before, which is used um, in SSL uh, for certificates. And what is this? Uh, ITU standard. Um, back in the days, it was this, yeah, let's roll out company-wide. Uh, so, so everyone has their own, um, well, directory. And of course, uh, in those directories, each person always just ex ex uh, exists once, even across directories. It was some Interesting assumptions. Um, some of them have, have been worked around, some of them haven't. Um, and the really bad thing is that was pre-XML times. So they have to come up with something, and that something back then was ASM1. Um, ASM1 uh, is not an encoding himself, uh, itself. Um, there are several encoding rules for that, and actually you have to implement at least two of them, I think, BR and DR are usually mandatory to get this working properly, and CR, I think, too. Um, fields can contain arbitrary data, um, and most encodings are extremely easy to get wrong, and this has huge security implications. Like, every time, uh, every time someone decides to, uh, to write an X509 parser uh, low level for their BIOS or whatever, the security crowd goes crazy and says, yay, um, because that's particularly easy to exploit because it's so easy to get wrong. Um, next, pardon? Okay. Um, 
next part, uh, common name, alternative subject fields. Um, can contain IPs or host names. Well, host names because lately people figured out that maybe an IP uh, for each, uh, for each uh, virtual host is not viable. Um, so you can have proper names, you can, you can use wildcards, you can use IPs, but wait. Uh, star dot IP, and this used to work. This used to work back until 2011 um, because people weren't careful enough. Next thing, should, uh, should the, how far should the wildcard reach? This, uh, how should a wildcard reach? Uh, this has only be, also been um, rather unclear and has been clarified years ago. Um, next problem, IDNs, international domain names. Who of you knows Unicode? Who really knows Unicode? <laughs> okay, there's one thing about Unicode um, which causes pain and pain and pain and which we've also been exposed to because, well, we, we are syncing files. File names are, in, are encoded in Unicode and there's arbitrary amount of ways you can get this wrong. Um, first of all, because a thing like uh, U or any umlauts or whatever uh, can be written in two ways. I can say this is a single symbol. Or, because it's Unicode, I can say this is a U with, two, uh, with a diacrit on top, with the two double dots. Um, this makes two separate entities. And basically, the, the, first, uh, the second says, okay, I'm related to the first. So this is two ways to represent the same character. Now, uh, as a computer scientist, you say it's not a problem, it's two different representations, and only the eye can be fooled. The problem is that those can be considered equivalent by a certain parsers because that's in the standard. So there you go. Um, this, is, this is really dangerous stuff, and it's been discussed over and over again, but it's also a problem. It's, it's nothing new, not at all, but it's also a problem in writing a proper parser. I'm not envying anyone having to write a parser for this because it's extremely easy to get wrong. So, easy solution, right? Kick it. Well, it's not really realistic, right? Um, just redoing something as complex uh, as SSL is not really viable. Uh, especially because some of the things that are wrong with SSL are not in the implementation. This is just, that, that was really just to scare you. You remember, we still, have the, we still have the problem of trust, we still have the problem of revocation, and this is not going away by thinking of something else in ASN1, for, for, uh, for instance. Um, so, what do we do? Um, first of all, please make sure that in your application domain, get a valid certificate. This can be your own CA that's being rolled out, um, coming to this later, uh, but just for the sake of it, if you're an open source project, GlobalSign has a, a project that gives you uh, free certificates. Otherwise, if you have only one domain to, uh, or only one host to secure, start SSL is good enough that's going to solve it for many, many of you in the first place. And I know that's not a convenient answer. Um, make sure you send all intermediate certificates, and that's really important. Send the intermediate certificates, but not the final root certificate. That's what people or what CAs and browser vendors recommend. Use a good cipher, uh, cipher suite, and again, you probably don't know what the best cipher suite is, neither do I. That's why smart people have places to look things up. In this case, uh, Mozilla is a good address. Um, another problem that, that you have is uh, downgrade attacks, or not even downgrade. You enter a site, it's HTTP, you know it's, it's supposed to be HTTPS, but instead of redirecting a man in the middle, will simply redirect you to his own server because the initial redirect is unencrypted. Um, there is no good solution to that. There is only a second to uh, best solution, which is called uh, a strict uh, transport security. 
And what it does is you send an extra header, which on first connect via HTTPS will make the browser remember that this site is supposed to be HTTPS only connectable and it will make the redirect automatically. It won't even try uh, to connect the initial uh, HTTPS connection, uh, to make the initial connection. Um, why is the second to best? Because it's trust on first use. First use means, well, it can go wrong on first use if you're in the wrong place. But again, it's the best I know of. Um, certificate pinning, and this is something, at least as far as I'm aware, you can't do yourself in a browser, but certain browser vendors have gone to implement it. Um, so in Chrome, for instance, you have a static list compiled in of sites, and what they do is they pin, uh, for instance, the CA that is allowed to issue, um, that is allowed to issue uh, the uh, certificates. Pardon? Was there a question? Okay. Um, so um, they, they basic, this is by the way how they found out um, that there were rogue Google certificates because Chrome was complaining and uh, Google, well, was listening. Um, um, so what they do is they ping the upstream CA. Why don't they pin the certificates? Well, the certificates need to be replaceable. They know they're going to issue from their own CA, so it's easy enough because they know they will only issue from that CA. What if the CA gets owned? Well, they update Chrome. And this also shows why this is practical for Google, but probably not for everyone. Um, and again, the main problem here is, and it's by the way also feasible for those uh, using, uh, doing, uh, um, uh, doing mobile apps. They can simply pin because they know what to ping, uh, pin basically. Um, but even then, uh, and there is a good paper that I have in the reference list, um, it's, not, uh, it's not necessarily clear what to pin, so read your documentation on that. And the biggest problem is, um, a static list of pinning looks a hell lot like a host.txt in the 80s, and it basically comes down to the same. It's just, ex -flex uh, it's just ex -flex uh, flexible, um, which is not. And finally, test your configuration. Um, this is probably a site that many of you already know. Um, gives you uh, the results for your page. Um, and so you know that you've done everything right. And your reward will be talking about the uh, gamification, a lot of green bars. Um, why is it not, uh, not 100%? Um, that's very easy. 100% would mean you sacrifice compatibility uh, with older browsers. So uh, pick your poison. Um, but I think something that is considered A plus by Ivan, who's uh, the author of this tool, um, should be good enough for both. And actually, it also lists you why it came to that conclusion. So it's not just some random magic number. There's at least an explanation why that number is magic. But of course, there is a number of things that sysadmins cannot fix. Um, and the very basic problem here is, on the one hand, you have security. In security, you want a white list of sites you're absolutely sure that you're securely connected to. Uh, implementation uh, mess ups apart. Um, on the other hand, you have high availability. You want your site to be available. If anything fails in that reporting line, you actually, from a security pers uh, from, a, from a security perspective, would have to say no. On the, from an availability perspective, you want to say, yeah, well, in case of doubt, just send the stuff uh, because you want you want uptime. You don't want to lose customers. So this is the very basic problem um, that you, where you have to pick your poison. And because you're not picking it alone, you, uh, you have other people's browser vendor CAs, etc., uh, making a good set of choices for you in that regard. Um, the other thing, and here is what I think is going to be the best solution for certificate revocation. Um, it's not yet in place, but I think it doesn't get better than OSCP pinning, uh, stapling with a few extensions. So first of all, we have revocation lists. Revocation lists, they used to be a few kilobytes. 
a few C, uh, CA, uh, a few exploded CAs later, they've grown to megabytes, and they are most likely to grow beyond that. So downloading a static CRL again and again uh, is not really a scalable and viable solution. Enter um, uh, the online certificate status protocol. And what they do there is basically in parallel to each request or before each request, they ask a specific CA server, uh, okay, uh, is that certificate still okay? And the certificate server then answers with yes or uh, with yes or no or I don't know. So this is the first thing which makes OCSP somewhat questionable. A, a protocol that can reply with I don't know is not really useful. The second, of, the second thing is uh, you can do, uh, as, an, as an attacker, you can try denial of service on this um, because it's just an HTTP, uh, uh, HTTP connection. Um, so it's, it's, it's not really working out, right? That's what, um, that's what smart people saw as well. And they came up with uh, OCSP stapling. Um, what this does, as the name indicates, it staples an OCSP response to the actual reply from the server. So suppose you have your, you have your reply. Is anyone um, familiar with Kerberos? Okay, so I should maybe explain just, just for a second. What this basically does is the server has, um, has um, a ticket that, uh, from the CA that says you are allowed to uh, say that your, um, that your uh, certificate is valid for the next 10 hours for instance. So you can arbitrarily resize that window. Right now that window is rather large usually. Um, and that would basic, and it's signed with the CA certificate that you have anyway because you need to establish a trust relation, right? So um, that would mean that um, you don't leak your browser history because before you leaked your browser history. Every time you ask for a website, your browser would have to ask the CA, is this okay? As a consequence, the CA gets to get all your browsing history, uh, which is just not cool. Um, you, would uh, you would mitigate that. Um, of course, this still doesn't solve everything. Last time I tried to deploy this on my Nginx, it showed that every time a worker was, uh, was firing up, the first request would be unstapled. Um, so not a lot of people seem to be using this right now, at least not in the mode that I was running it in. Um, Apache 2.2, which most distributions uh, still ship, doesn't have it as well, yada, 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 yada. So there's an arbitrary number of problems with that as well, but we're getting better. We're getting better. Next thing would be OCSP. I'm sorry, I made a typo there. OCSP must staple, which uh, reminiscent of um, uh, this, trans uh, this uh, uh, secure transport header basically adds a header that says, okay, this response needs stapling. Otherwise, you, and you could do this in a number of other ways. You could have this information in the certificate um, and the browser could remember that. Um, and the bad thing or the very sorry thing is that at least OCSP stapling has been in Windows Server 2008. I mean, come on, this is six years ago, six years ago, Microsoft had OCSP stapling, which again, is not the definite answer, but it's better than anything we currently, to my best knowledge, have. Um, so Apache 2.2, and this is the next problem. Uh, most uh, people use stable or LTS or enterprise, which is to say ancient uh, uh, distributions back from Egypt. Um, and sometimes, like Red Hat uh, decided that they may want to actually ship a more recent S uh, a lib SSL and relink their applications. Most of the times, vendors just ship a new version of OpenSSL, which is completely useless because all the applications they ship for compatibility reasons, for certification reasons, for whatever reasons, is still linked with the old library. So the benefit of this for the systems administrator 
uh, unless they use some funky backports, and they, again, they have to be aware of this, is zero. Um, and it's of course not interchangeable because, well, it's open SSL and it's simply not binary compatible, so you can't just swap libraries. Um, so my call to action would be uh, sysadmins try to adhere to be best practices, and again, in, in the end of my presentation, I have a couple of URLs, and also in my blog, you will find uh, a good list of uh, references uh, on, on the topic. Um, second of all, um, track what's going on with regard to SSL, TLS. Um, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of standards that are being proposed. Um, it takes a while as, as, as it goes with standard um, standards. And second of all, uh, and, and third of all, think if you really need old versions, think about it. If it's not possible to have a better ratio between enterprise stability enterprise stability and uh, up-to-date software uh, that actually allows you to configure these things. Again, Apache 2.2 is still the most used uh, Apache web server, um, and it's not allowing for all the interesting things that Microsoft, and this is really, I hope this, this puts a sting to many of you. Microsoft had this back in 2008 on enabled by default. Um, distributions should therefore really follow the example of, for instance, Red Hat, and Red Hat was apparently also very reluctant with that choice. Um, and of course, it's not easy. There are certification programs. There's money involved. Um, there are um, other people involved that would then need to put money into this. Um, but that should not be. We're talking security. We're talking about the very integrity of IT. We cannot mess with that. Um, so, we're done, right? Well, again, not really. Uh, we've discussed HTTP servers and browsers. Uh, the same, of course, applies for everything else that does SSL TLS. Um, good news is you now, now know how to use Cypher, Cypher suites. Um, same principle pri uh, applies. Um, there is not much more to take away from this than go to the right sites, find, find, uh, find the right ciphers, um, apply it, and keep track. Keep track if um, a cipher is considered uh, unsecure uh, two months later. That is now still hyped. That can easily happen. It's your responsibility to keep track of this just as you track your, uh, your upgrades and your uh, vulnerabilities, right? That's what you do anyway. Um, so now, um, we've done most of the sysadmin part. Uh, let's talk about applications. Let's talk about mobile apps. Let's talk, and there we are again, your treasure shell scripts. Um, Modern SSL APIs are basically designed in a way uh, that you could write a browser with them. They're not designed to help you if you just want to get your job done. Um, we're not talking about open SSL. Open SSL APIs are not designed. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. They are not designed. Um, You've got to roll your own certificate handling. You've got to roll your own warning dialogues. And you have to get all the warnings right from the enumerations in the documentation of the different SSL implementations. You have to get mixed mode handling right, which is extremely difficult. Um, you have to get your auto updates right. Are you using transport security for your updates? Are you checking for integrity? Are you checking for authenticity? Um, this is where many, many people fail including AV vendors. Antivirus vendors fail to authenticate um, their updates. Um, and this is 2000, uh, that was in 2013, I think, so last year. 
Um, we're coming to that in a bit. Um, so, and uh, if you, like we, had to go, uh, you have to go cross-platform um, with your application, and you have to do this all on your own, oh my god. Of course, there's help, there is Java, there is, uh, for instance, a native, uh, native toolkits like Qt, they're going to help you to a certain degree. Uh, but in general, it's still a lot of pain because the implementations on each platform is going to be slightly different. Um, those things are fortunately often caught in OSS, although I would really love to see desktop applications <laughs> reviewed for that specific thing. Um, but closed source, all your favorite Windows shareware, do you know? Do you check? Have you ever fired up Wireshark and seen if you, if you switch a byte if, if the update fails? I haven't. Okay, uh, mobile apps, same, uh, same issue. Uh, you're writing an app for that, chances are you're doing it wrong. Why is that? Um, we have a very good paper by Pfahl uh, et al. Uh, from Hanover University. They analyzed the uh, 13,500 popular, most popular um, applications. And what's interesting is they were able to capture uh, credit card numbers, Twitter accounts, Google accounts, Yahoo accounts, IBM sentence accounts, and so on, and so on, and so on. All because application authors were unable or were unwilling or did not understand what it means to properly implement SSL uh, within the application. And they, this is what I was referring to earlier, they were able to forge antivirus signature updates. So even antivirus apps were unable uh, to properly SSL secure their communication. Um, so the common problems they found in this paper, that applications were trusting all certificates, or they were checking if the certificates were valid, but they did not check the host name in that certificate, which is about as disastrous. Um, they were, and with Android, you have a special problem. You support Android 2.2. Android 2.2 has, has a, t a certificate store that still includes, for instance, DigiNotar. Um, you can trust that, I wouldn't. Um, and again, mixed mode content, because again, mixed mode content handling is complicated. Um, and then you may say, okay, that's perfectly fine. I'm not doing uh, this, uh, crazy iOS, uh, this crazy Android stuff. I'm an iOS author, and the App Store is, is curated. It means that Apple has a dedicated review process, and it would certainly catch that, right? <laughs> and to quote the doctor, I'm so, so sorry, um, but that's not what's happening. Uh, in another paper, the same authors uh, looked at um, uh, about 1,000 applications. Why, why is it only that few compared to uh, Android? Again, very simple. In Android, it was, uh, they were able to spider the applications in uh, iOS and in the App Store. That's, that was not as trivial. Um, they found about 10%, no, 1%, were uh, vulnerable. No, 10%. Were vulnerable. Um, and uh, 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 a much larger uh, amount were unable to give the correct error message. And uh, some of them simply refused to connect. They have had no error handling whatsoever. So, curated app store, you fail. Um, and what was the problems? What, what, what were the problems this time? Well, only Basic SSL APIs available, that's what I mentioned. Um, there was an improper understanding of underlying technology. So what they did in the second study was they were asking, so they were all notifying the app authors of the apps they found to be vulnerable. Um, they explained the issue and they were asking if they were willing to, um, to do an interview. Some of them said yes, 
uh, most of them understood the issue after explanation, but, after, but some of them, even after being explained what the problem is, did not see that they, well, had a problem. Um, so apparently there's people doing security related stuff that fail even after being educated to understand what the problem is. That is of course the biggest problem and you can't solve that with technology. Um, the next thing again is a social thing. Um, you have a problem with this strange SSL thingy, you don't know what it is, uh, so you go to your favorite programming site and of course there is an answer to that because there is always an answer on Stack Overflow. Um, and the answer in SSL is usually, well, there is this fancy ignore all, all uh, SSL errors flag. You turn that on, you're good. Um, another one, uh, popular mobile frameworks, and uh, you can read which ones these are in the studies, and I think they may already have fixed some of those. Um, they default to not check their certificates. Again, this is because of, um, those certificates are meant to be easy to use, and if the first thing you see is an error that you need to handle in your API, there's a good chance um, people will hate your framework, and this is why the framework authors decided to, by default, disable checks. Another thing they found is the checks were implemented, then disabled for development purposes because they were checking uh, with uh, self certificates, but then failed to rearm that check. So essentially, it was like this check never existed. So what can you do? And for some reason, the last one always pops up first. Um, you can... Um, what we would basically need, and this is also a conclusion of this paper, they designed, um, they designed a framework that gives you, that gives you the uh, essential uh, features that you will need. That you don't have to write any dialogues, any any checks. Um, so they basically treat you as an application in the browser, with the, uh, rather than an application, uh, rather than a browser to stay in the picture uh, that I was uh, drawing in the beginning. Um, they're taking away most of the flexibility that you have. Doesn't matter because usually you don't need it. And with that, uh, they were able to substantially uh, improve, uh, improve security. So one conclusion we can take away is that essentially everyone who offers an SSL API needs to offer convenience APIs. Those APIs themselves need to include a developer mode and it needs to be very, very hard to actually forget to turn it off. Um, so, while we do not have these frameworks, what, what do we do? Developers should treat SSL like it was their business domain. Why is that? Because it's protecting whatever your application that is your that is doing your business, uh, whatever your business domain is, and securing it. If it's not securing it, your business is in trouble. So SSL is as important as your actual business that this app is doing. Um, for uh, for um, people that have to deploy this, the Open SSL Cookbook is a good place to start. Again, ch uh, check the list in the in the end of the talk. Um, there's a lot of good documentation, and most of the things don't happen because people are stupid. It's because people don't know. It's because people um, forget about certain details. And again, it's not generally people's fault. It's the fault of people saying it has to be complex because it's crypto. And uh, finally, challenge your application. Try if you can change bytes and it blows up. Try if you can man in the middle of this. this is, there are a lot of free, easy to use tools, uh, tools out there that you can just add as a proxy to easily uh, tamper with um, 
uh, with secure c communications and it should be really easy um, to um, check if whatever you did uh, really secures your communication. So, because we have to hurry, the final thing is scripts, particularly bash scripts. This is also a pattern that I have seen myself and that I'm guilty to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, that I was really doing myself because I had to use infrastructure that I was not administrating. Um, your server uses self-science certificates. Uh, self um, well, okay. You need to retrieve SSL secure data from, from that server. Okay. You're using curl for that or wget. This is probably the most standard approach to go about this. Now you get this ugly, ugly warning uh, and they refuse to go on. Easy. Dash K. Do away with all the warnings. Congratulations, you just opened your communication to man in the middle attacks. Um, and then again, yes, you're probably in your own you're, you're probably in your own network, but still you have to ask yourself why are you doing encryption in the first place if you're going to tamper with it later on in that way. So even if you're doing this internally, please at least do it properly. Create your own CA, roll it out. Uh, there are a number of good uh, uh, good toolkits to uh, to roll your own CA. If you don't want that, there is still CA cert that is not in any browser, but can be easily rolled out. There is, again, there is also solutions for that. Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, you name it. Uh, if, if it's something that you cannot do by hand, there's a good chance you already want these things anyway. Um, or really, if you're a business, if time is money, just get a wildcard certificate for, for your internal domain. So finally, um, it's really bad, um, but it, it has to be done. It has to be done properly, because if we don't, um, then, and it doesn't even have to be the NSA. We've learned that the BND is doing the same, and it's uh, not really any surprise. Uh, and you will probably also find other secret services or large organizations doing this. There, there is enough interest to to spy on certain communications, and we are making uh, we're making it very easy for everyone who has an interest in spying by not being careful. Uh, and with that, I thank for, uh, for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Um, I have not looked into the specs of HTTP2 yet. I know that it is uh, that it contains just like um, the uh, Google inspired protocol, um, uh, the Google sponsored protocol, uh, Speedy, um, that it includes uh, in encryption intrinsically, right? Um, and that is a good thing. That said, I have not looked into the specifications myself, uh, so I cannot judge on that. Okay, um, so I'm, I'm repeating this. Let, let me quickly repeat what we are talking about uh, because then people from remote can follow. So the question was HTTP2 negotiation. Uh, is, is that, uh, isn't that a problem? Because essentially the negotiation on whether or not to, uh, to upgrade to HTTP2, which has intrinsic encryption, um, uh, can be man in the middle and you, can, you basically can do a uh, downgrade attack uh, and my answer to this is I don't know because I haven't studied uh, the HTTP2 protocol in detail. Any other questions? Yep. Um, go ahead. Uh, this is interesting. Um, I was I was wondering if we should. Uh, if I should talk about Dane, but again, this is something that I haven't invested close enough to make qualified uh, 
uh, statements on it. Basically, yes, it could if you trust Dane, because in Dane, as far as I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, you have two parties that, have you, that you have to trust. Um, both of them control, uh, both of them uh, is, uh, are organizations that can very easily be tampered by uh, political interests, like the Ruth CA, which is run by the United States, for Ted Dane, right? Uh, the DNS, and the local DNS, which is usually countries. So you have basically two places uh, where uh, state-sponsored uh, le legislation can easily tamper with this. But Dane is probably still a legit idea. But then again, what about revocation? Dane does not solve the revocation problem, does it? <coughs> yes, 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 yes. In theory, there will be a way. Um, I do remember that there have been um, that there have been attempts to do this in Dane. Um, the biggest problem with Dane, however, is it's not there today. And the question is if it ever will be, because the penetration, frankly, is dire. And uh, what is about sovereign keys to fix the CA problem? Pardon? Sovereign keys. Can you? Um, a draft I haven't read, to be honest. Can you, can you uh, uh, summarize that in a few sentences? Okay. So, um, as I said, there are a number of, there are a number of drafts uh, to solve particular issues. I've just chosen the one that I thought had the best potential. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe some other draft will do it. And again, this is not meant to be the definite guide on how to solve problems. This is just something I think uh, might solve the problem in a realistic way. It's not the best way. I completely agree on that if you say this is not the best way of solving um, the revocation problem or the, the SSL problem in general. I completely agree, um, but I think it's a viable way at least. Okay, um, any questions, any later questions we can discuss downstairs. My time is up, thank you. <laughs>